Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, Cookies Part Three, Lesson Nine. <clears throat> we are winding down. Uh, Y'all have been faithful here online and uh, and locally in the combinations of both, uh, and going through the entire Word of God in uh, around 30 weeks with breaks for holidays and things like that. Uh, very, very good. Y'all have done a very good job. Let me pray for us. <clears throat> we'll, <clears throat> excuse me, talk uh, about this lesson, work our way through it. So, Lord, I thank you for your word. And, Lord, I thank you for this massive overview, you know, this flying over from the top and looking down and, and, and just seeing big pictures of some things. Now, I thank you for that opportunity. And, Lord, especially this evening, I ask that you would just show us your truth. Uh, Lord, as we um, do what your scripture tells us to do, just to come, let us reason together uh, to see what you have to say. And so, Father, I pray that you will teach us, that you will give us uh, your understanding. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, uh, just, just to be forewarned, my computer is acting a little weird. I don't know what, the, what it was doing. I think it will be okay. But if it should suddenly just act really, really weird, let's not be surprised. I got a couple of backup things here going on, but sometimes those kind of things happen. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I sort of struggle with what to do with these last couple of lessons because we're looking at just vast amounts of information. Yeah, yeah Karen, Karen sent me a private message. Are you sure it's the computer? No, I'm not at all sure it's the computer, Karen. But I figure that's the easiest thing to blame it on right at the moment. Okay, but I, I think it'll be okay. <laughs> Um, like next week's lesson is real simple. Okay, next week's lesson you read Revelation, Hebrews, and John. Okay, just just master Revelation, Hebrews, and John, and you've got it made. Uh, even for an overview, it's a lot of information. So, uh, well, hey, Sabrina, welcome. Hey. Yeah, we're just getting started here. And so, uh, what I thought we would do tonight is just to uh, uh, just uh, see what you thought. See what struck you about our reading, because this week we were looking uh, and the balance of Acts, Acts 22 through Acts 28, and then the various writings of Paul, uh, particularly the writings that he uh, uh, that he wrote while he was in prison in Rome, uh, which would have been uh, what was it, Second Timothy, Colossians, uh, Philemon, and uh, Philippians, and uh, I mean that's that's a lot of things to even just a cursory do a reading over. And so uh, I thought we would do that, Karen. Cora's going, yeah, right, 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 right. So tell me, um, in the time that you had to study this week, in the time that you had to read, what were the various things that struck you? I noticed, oh, right. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that um, that Paul although he got into a lot of confrontations, it wasn't really his fault. And uh, he really preached all the way through his letters, be at peace with all men and be peaceful. I just was really struck by that. Mm, yeah. Was he always successful at being peaceful? No. No. What did he do when he was not successful with being peaceful? I like that word, that phrase. Yeah, you're saying some good things here on the truth. Yeah, he would speak forth the truth in love. But uh, without really going through all the details, I mean, we could we could go through Acts and, you know, just sort of follow the story. But I know that y'all read it. I know you saw what happened right there. Uh, what Cora says right there is so, so true, how pervasive the, uh, the Judaizers were. Who, what's the Judaizer? What do you mean by that? And why Cora's typing that, I'm going to follow up on a couple of things. Uh, you remember the incident right there when Paul was undergoing one of his examinations and he uh, said something to somebody and then they slapped him for it and he sort of smarted back at him and they said, why are you talking to the high priest like that? Yes. What, did, what, did, what did Paul do next? He, he uh, backed down. He knew that the scripture that said you shouldn't address your uh, – he didn't realize that that was the high priest at the time or so he said. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> what do you mean? So he said. Well, Paul was a he was a um, Pharisee. I don't know how he didn't know who the high priest was. Maybe he didn't recognize him. Maybe he hadn't seen him. 
Yeah, Lanesa sent me a private message there saying didn't recognize them. Uh, that's interesting, Sabrina. I hadn't thought about it quite that way, but that might be an option right there. Could he have been sort of speaking tongue in cheek right there? I don't know, but it just seemed unusual to me that he didn't know who the high priest was. Uh, it did me too, because generally speaking, would they not have had on some form of garment that would have been somewhat representative of that? Yeah, Karen's wanting to know if it's a new high priest on the block. And then you also run into that thing, which honestly, I'm still not real, real clear on in the scripture when you see it. Uh, uh, Cora says she missed this and wants to know where it is. Uh, somebody find it for her there in Acts, that little part. Uh, I don't remember exactly. 23 and 3. Where is it? 23 and 3. 23-3. Uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see you'll see the chief priest and you'll see high priest. So you had several chief priests, but you would have the high priest. But then, you know, sometimes, particularly like in the story of Jesus uh, on his last week, you have somebody that's serving as a high priest. But the previous high priest was like the father-in-law, and he'd stepped aside because of Roman demand or something like that. You have all sorts of political dynamics going on uh, within all this. Uh, the thing that was just curious to me about it was, uh, at best, uh, Paul was uh, – apologetic for it you know he says i did not know brethren that he was the high priest where it's written you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people and so i just sort of took it at face value i don't know how he didn't know that he wasn't the high priest i don't know if he was doing it tongue-in-cheek you know to say well a high priest shouldn't be acting that way you know? well we don't know how close he was to him either because it's ananias uh, was it ananias this time the high priest Ananias commanded that they oh, yeah. did it, stood by him, yeah. Yeah. So, and, you know, uh, I mean, he should have known Ananias. Well, I don't know which Ananias is. It. Well, that, that's true. Because it's I think, I, yeah, uh, how many were there, Sabrina, when we, the Ananias that laid hands on Paul, you know, to uh, heal him uh -huh. when he was blinded. When I was reading about that, I want to say, I know there's at least seven different Ananiases in Scripture. Huh. But I think there were more than that, maybe in the double digits. Uh, just you know, just something I ran across in reading. I don't even remember. Uh, but anyway, it, it goes to what y'all were saying a while ago. Uh, that uh, the way that Paul acted, the way that he reacted, that even when he was being falsely accused, even when he knew, we saw this last week, that he was uh, uh, being sent to Jerusalem, and he knew that he also uh, was going to be sent to Rome. You know, that eventually he was going to wind up in Rome. Boy, y'all been sitting on saying a lot of chat. Let me see what's going on. Uh, um, yeah, okay. And so anyway, Paul winds up uh, being brought before the powers that be in Jerusalem, and uh, some people precipitated the plan uh, to do what? To get rid of him. How were they yeah. going to murder him? Were they serious about this? Yeah, there were 40 men who made a uh, vow uh -huh. that they would uh, kill him as the council. The council was going to call him forth from where he was with the centurion in Caesarea, right? And yeah. it, they called him up to Jerusalem for the council, and these 40 men were going to lie in wait and murder him on the way. And they had taken a vow that they would not eat or drink until such time as they were able to kill Paul, but uh, somebody got word of it. Yeah, yeah, and that's pretty serious if you devout that you're not going to eat or drink until it's done. So what's the time frame for this thing? We're going to do it now, right? You know, it's going to be quick. Uh, who was it that got wind of it? My sister's son. Yeah, so that would be who to Paul? His nephew. His nephew, exactly. His nephew. So what did we learn about Paul's family right there? That was one of the questions you had in your homework. He had family other than just, you know, the father and the mother. Yeah, he, he had family members. And, uh, yeah, they, they loved him, and they were concerned about him. Also, they had some access. I mean, his son had access to find out what was happening here uh, within the barracks or something like that. He, he had heard that something was going on. So Paul tells him what to do, and he goes down and he lets the uh, – uh, the commander, I think is how he was described in some translations right here. Let the commander know what's going on. Uh, Sabrina, you said he was very young. How do you know that? 
because when he talks to the governor or the commander, he takes them by the hand and leads them away to talk to him. You wouldn't do that with a grown man. Now, is that not an interesting insight? Yeah, 2319. The commander takes him by the hand to question him. Well, 8 to 17 says he was bringing this young man. Uh, mm -hmm. is, yeah. yeah, but you're right. It, it calls him a young man, but there's a difference between a young 18-year-old and a young 9-year-old. Right. Oh, that is good. Yeah. So he takes him by the hand, and he tells him what's going on, and he believed him. So what was the response of the commander? What did he decide to do? He was going to move Paul and send him to where? Yeah, this yeah. is where he takes him to Caesarea. Caesarea, right, right. So they, they snuck him out literally in the middle of the night. And so did they just saddle him up on a horse and send, send a couple of people with him? No, this is where they call 200 soldiers and horsemen. 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. 470 people to take one guy on a trip up the road? What a lot of people on? hated Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Karen says overkill. I think it was to protect the kill. Yeah, I mean, they must have known these other folks were serious that there was a problem right. out here. And so this commander is trying to communicate something. Okay? He's trying to communicate something right here. You know, that, well, had Paul not stirred up all kinds of trouble among the the Sex of people with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So, you know. how had he how had he done that? Well, after that, uh, he was called in on the carpet for uh, his remark about the high priest. Right. Then he he goes in and tells them, you know, I'm a Pharisee, and um, why, I have hope why? of the resurrection of the dead. Why does he do that? Well, he knows that the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. Exactly. And so they're trying to. Uh, he knew that something was going on here. He knew that this wasn't going his way. So he looks around and he sees who's in the room. And he sees there's Pharisees and there's Sadducees. So he decides to do what? Start a confrontation. <laughs> Between who? Between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Between them, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's exactly it. Uh, uh, yeah, Sabrina says provoking them, taking the focus off of him. And really bringing the focus to to uh, the attention that he wanted, okay, to the attention he wanted. I, I think this is this kind of thing is really really important for us as the body of Christ, okay, because we get so distracted by things, particularly the church and our organization, get so distracted with things. <clears throat> it, it, I could sit here and go the balance of our time with just how I see the church being distracted here locally, and, and just and just how we do church, okay. And how we really are, and even particularly this week when we have a little special emphasis on the resurrection, you know, and most churches are distracted by uh, uh, tossing Easter eggs out of helicopters and, and chasing bunny rabbits and that kind of thing. When when the truth is what the resurrection. So what was Paul wanting to get to? He wanted to get to the power of the gospel message, the resurrection. So he's sitting there, and he just sort of sets up this little uh, uh, confrontation. Because he says, I'm a Pharisee, and I'm here, and I'm on trial for the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And that's the reason I'm being judged. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, it explodes between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. <clears throat> I've actually seen that kind of thing happen in ministerial meetings. When they sit there and they're talking about something, and all of a sudden, it's just this huge division between the exact type of thought right here. <laughs> so Paul <clears throat> knew what was happening, but he knew how to handle a situation right here like that. I thought that was very shrewd of him uh, in handling it that way. So he winds up getting hauled off to of Caesarea, and uh, the commander had sent a, um, a note to uh, uh, Lysias saying, hey, here's what's going on with this guy. You know, uh, take him and see what you can do with it. So uh, where does Paul wind up when he's in Caesarea? Now, Nene just says something really, really important, and this is a major, that's probably the thing that I was struck about the most in, in this week's lesson. Uh, yeah, he winds up being held in the Harris Praetorium, about to go before Felix the governor. Did y'all notice the time frames that were involved with all this? Generally speaking, how long did it take 
Paul to get from Jerusalem to Rome? I think somewhere I read he was in prison and on traveling over five years. Prison and traveled over five years? Uh, yeah, when you put the in prison part, that's true. He was held right here for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. He left him here, was on the boat, wound up on the island where they wintered. I think they were there for three months. Then he winds up in uh, yeah, down Malta. And then he winds up in Rome, and he was actually kept on house arrest in Rome for two years. Uh -huh. And apparently was let go. Uh, the scripture doesn't tell us that, but he was let go because we do know that he went to other places. We don't know the order, but he refers to them in uh, letters that he wrote later. And then he was arrested again, and that's when he was taken back to Rome and executed. So mm -hmm. from this journey right here and the time that he spent the two years there and the two years over uh, in Rome, yeah, five years. Now, why – is that important? Maybe I'm the only one that it's important to, but that was sort of important to me. Karen, why do you think that was important to me? Put Karen on the spot here. I'm really sorry. I was giving someone the password. I didn't hear you. Uh, who are you giving the password this time that I missed? Uh, Marie. Uh, oh, hey, Marie. Okay. Good. Good. I try to keep things open just in case um, somebody needs that. <laughs> Here's why. Uh, it, it goes to how we approach life and what we're doing in life. All too often we sit there and think, well, God's called me to do this, to do this, to do this, and it has to be done now. And we don't realize that, yes, the Lord has called you to do something. The Lord had called Paul to go into the world. A lot of times referred to as, uh, you know, the greatest evangelist, you know. And as the greatest evangelist, yeah, Sabrina, that's where I was going. He did. Isn't it strange that as the greatest evangelist, he was in prison for the, I, I could probably pretty well say the greater portion of the time, particularly on this particular journey. And that just sort of goes in the opposite direction of the way that we think about things. And we, we don't have patience. Yeah, slowed him down enough to cause him to write. Yeah. I mean, he spent a lot of time writing and meditating. But I think it really goes down to how we approach and how we live the life of the kingdom of life. Uh, yeah, Gene, you're right. God really sees things a totally different perspective. Uh, our perspective is this, that we come and we will share the gospel with somebody or we'll say something to somebody. If they don't believe at that moment, if they don't say our little magical mantra at that time, then that's it. And we totally don't see what Paul says to the church of Ephesus, what we saw last week, that he was with them for years and he cried with them and he worked with them. We don't see what Peter said. Uh, well, in the second chapter of Acts right here uh, with Peter, uh, where it said, and with many other words, with many other words, he kept trying to make them believe. He kept trying to communicate to them. We really do, Sharice. We're sort of a one and done kind of thing. And so, uh, yeah, when, also, very good, Gene. We think that suffering is wrong. And if we're suffering, we must be outside of God's will and something must be wrong. We have a really skewed uh, understanding of what kingdom success is. And I think when you pay attention to these little things that happen within Paul and his life, uh, you see some real differences uh, with some things. Yeah, Gene, very twisted, very twisted. And so, yeah, I'm sorry, somebody's going to share something, Gene? Well, today I was uh, reading Second Timothy and just um, thinking on, on my way, I drive long distance, uh, just thinking, you know, um, it's uh, the end of his life. And he had a really hard life, a lot of opposition. Uh, he was in prison. And, you know, if nowadays, I, so many people think, oh, I don't have a good mentor. I don't have um, someone like Paul to lead me, to mentor me. But I was thinking, you know, even if there is a Paul beside me, will I be able to say, oh, I want to follow him? I might be say, oh, that's too hard. I want to follow someone who has uh -huh. everything, has every, you know. But that's just a stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. And even at the at the end of Paul's life, you know, Paul was uh, uh, mentored, you know, for lack of a better term, by who? The Lord Jesus. We know that from the things that he said, but that was at the beginning. At the end of his life, he was actually writing Timothy, and he, he knew his life was coming to the end. He says, but by the way, you know, Bring bring the uh, uh, bring the scriptures to me. 
you know, bring these things. Uh, and, you know, I think that really says some things to us. Uh, you know, what are we doing? I mean, just this group right here. Look at this great group right here. Look up down that list, okay? Uh, these are people literally from all over the world, just in this one class right here. And how are we seizing the moment and doing what he did? You know, when the guard was with him, he's testifying to the guards. We know that because of some letters that he wrote back, and he's saying, hey, everybody here uh, says hi to y'all. And it turns out that not a small number of the Roman Praetorium, I think so it was, became believers. You know? So here they are day in and day out when he's under that house arrest, and he's testifying to them. His friends would come by. Other people would come by. He really wanted to go. He had such a desire, particularly to go to Spain. But as what uh, uh, Sabrina said earlier, it gave him time to sit there, and the spirit moved upon him, and he wrote some letters. And that's just in this one situation right here. But what is it that God is wanting us to do? You know, he's given us such opportunities. Is he wanting us to, uh, uh, to, to lead in a Bible study, perhaps? Is he wanting us just to speak words of encouragement? I mean, the big, big thing that's coming out is just to be able to sit there and just send out tweets. You know, what is it that you can send in an encouraging way to in 140 characters? I got a group of guys that I'm meeting with, and uh, they're wanting to do Daniel. I said, we're doing Daniel. And so I send them two or three little tweets a week, and they'll just be like, uh, 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 just word. I mean, literally a word, uh, literally a word. Like I sent one today saying this, yeah, but there is a God. And you're thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, they're supposed to be reading the second chapter of Daniel. So if you've ever taken that, you know what that is, you know. Uh, just that kind of thing. <clears throat> yeah, Karen, it, it does help for accountability. But uh, any, <clears throat> Karen, particularly me and you, of our age and how we grew up and everything, when you hear accountability, you immediately go, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. You know, it's like pressure. It's like, uh, no, we're talking about the, the kingdom work and encouraging and exhorting each other, you know. Yeah, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, but there is a God, O King. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so tomorrow when I meet with them, they're going to either say, well, yeah, I saw that in there, but or what does that mean? And, and what can we do on an ongoing basis and just encouraging and exhorting one another day in and day out? You see, Paul, doing that, I think we're going to be held to a higher standard. I mean, what would Paul have done if he were alive right now and he had the Internet? I mean, can you imagine? You know, what, what, what might have happened? So anyway, you see him uh, tweeting, blogging. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we will be held to a higher degree of accountability, Gene. I really think we will be. So uh, pinning, friending. Oh, I'm, I'm sure about the Facebook thing, Karen. Yeah, I think he uh, – yeah, not, not in the sense that people get enamored with it, but it's a sense of a tool. Uh, you know, I, I, I do it like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love what you're saying right here. So you saw him when he got hauled before Felix, when he got hauled before Festus, uh, when he came before King Agrippa. What was his pattern? What did he do every time? Repeat his conversion story. Yeah, he told what happened to him. Yeah, he just told what happened to him. What is the greatest thing that you can tell somebody? Right. That's your conversion. Exactly. It's about what is happening to you. It is wonderful to sit there and say, oh, you know, you need to get in this uh, Bible study with me online. You, you've got to hear this lady, Sabrina. She's the most brilliant thing I've ever heard. I mean, that's wonderful because Sabrina is brilliant, and I just love what the Lord does to her. Are you turning red, Sabrina? Yeah, I'm just using, using an example right here. But that's not where the power is, okay? It's, it's in coming along and saying, hey, let me tell you what the Lord has done for me and how I'm changed. And that's what Paul did. And I love the way that he came to the. And did you notice how with each situation that he spoke to the situation and what was occurring there? Can you give me some insights and some examples about what you gleaned from when he was talking with a, a, you know, King Agrippa or with Felix or with Festus? How did he handle those situations? Yeah, he never lacked the wisdom. 
<clears throat> he always had him listen. Remember what the Lord himself said that? Don't worry about that when you get hauled up where you want to know. Yeah, Korah, he knew that King Agrippa was an expert in the Jewish law, so he did what? He used that. Yeah, Karen, see, that's a good thing, being able to declare what you believe and why you believe it and why this is happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah, was somebody saying something that cut you off there? I thought I heard somebody. Okay. Um, he knew what the situation was, <clears throat> and he would speak to that. So with King Agrippa, that's a great example. He knew he knew the law, and he said, you know, King, I know that you understand these things. Because you're an expert, how did he say it, in the customs and the uh, questions with the Jews, that kind of thing. And so, Paul, you see him moving within wisdom. Well, what does that say to us? Are we to do likewise? Yeah, we should, and that's a good point, Gene. We must know the truth. We must know the truth. Did he try to uh, bring them into the kingdom when he talks with them? Oh, yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah, Nene says that she found that it was interesting that he would have been set free if he had not appealed uh, to Caesar. So, why did you find that interesting, baby? Yeah, he tells us the camp figured he'd been better off as a Roman citizen. Uh, sometimes people say, well, Paul messed up. I and mean, we talked a little bit about that last week, that he messed up and he shouldn't have gone to Jerusalem. He shouldn't have done this this way. Uh, I, I think that's probably an error, you know. He appealed to Rome because remember what had happened was he was asked when he was in uh, Caesarea, I think, do you want to go back to Jerusalem? We'll go back to Jerusalem and I'll judge you there. And he says, no, no, I'm here where I'm supposed to be. I'm here before the Roman uh, council, before the Roman thing. And so let me do that. Yeah, he said, I've done no wrong to the Jews. I've done no wrong to anybody. Uh, maybe he wanted to testify there. I, I, he knew he was going to Rome. Okay, he knew that. The, the Lord had revealed that to him, that he was going to be going to Rome. And so I, I think that he just uh, felt like that's what God was leading to do, and he appeals. So after going through all these things, he finally winds up getting put on the ship and being sent to Rome. Uh, tell me how the journey went. Yeah, Sharice, I think that's a good point. I think the Lord did lead him in this. <laughs> Rough waters, a storm. Well, you know, Felix Felix was so intent on pleasing the Jews that when he offered to send him to the um to Jerusalem to stand trial, that that just was unacceptable. There was no way he was gonna be able to survive that. Yeah, because he knew the game that was being played there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And was Felix the one, there was one of them that was uh, sort of waiting for Paul to grease his palm a little bit? Yeah, that was Felix. Yeah, you know what I mean? He, he was wanting some what? A bribe. Yeah, you give me a bribe, uh, which was really standard practice. You know, it really is standard practice in most societies, even today, uh, to help expedite things, shall we say, you know? And so uh, he winds up leaving, he gets on the boat, uh, they're on their way. He tries to talk them out of going because he says it's going to be a rough trip. And they get caught up in the storm. How long were they in that storm? 14 days. Yeah, at least 14 days. At least 14 days they were caught up in this thing. Uh, how do you think the atmosphere was in that boat? You all ever think about that kind of stuff? Stressful, fearful, fear. <clears throat> yeah, you saw what was happening. They were chunking stuff off the side of it at the very beginning, which means it was what? Sinking down. You see, at the end of it, they hadn't eaten anything. You think anybody got sick? I think they all probably were. Yeah, I'm about to yuck Cora out here. Sorry. 
I think they all probably were. I think it's probably one of the reasons they hadn't eaten in 14 days. Can you imagine 14 days being caught in that in the seasickness? Now, Sabrina, I found that interesting. That is a lot of people on a boat. I mean, it was. It, I think it would have been an organic nightmare. Did some of the people try to escape? Yes, they did. And what happens when they try to escape? Paul said that if you let them go, you're going to die. The only way uh, to survive is if everybody stays on board. So what did they do? Uh, they, they cut loose the boats and forced everyone to stay on board. Yeah, because he said you're going to die. If you stay with me. How could Paul say if you stay with me, you'll be okay? The Lord told him that. The Lord told him that. The Lord told him. And so, do you see a picture right here? Yes, the Lord is with him. The Lord had told him you're going to go uh, to uh, Rome. The Lord had told him that those that would be with him would be saved, that the men would be saved, but they would lose what? They'd lose the boat. They would lose the stuff they had. Cora, why were you surprised that the sailors listened to him? Yeah, well, why listen to him? Have you ever met people that are that are of God that they command attention without demanding attention? You know, when you hear them, when you see them, you realize, well, this is something. <laughs> That's a good point, Nene. God likes to test people's faith with boats and storms. <laughs> So they wind up making it. They wind up being shipwrecked. They lose the boat. They lose everything. At the end of the 14 days, Paul said, y'all need to take something to eat because we're about to get run up on the ground, so watch out for the ground. And they do. And they wind up on the island of Malta. It was cold and they were wet, so they did what? They built a fire. So what happened when they built a fire there? Fire and a viper. What's a viper? Are you talking about a dodge? I guess only Aaron and I will get that. The snakes came out, and Paul got bit by a snake. What kind of snake was it? A viper, an asp, a really highly, highly venomous, venomous, venomous. It's been a long day, guys. Venomous snake. And apparently. Uh, I mean, it was just hanging there. The people saw it. So what was the, the natives' reactions to that? I love this account. They thought he was a murderer. They thought he was cursed. They thought he was evil. You deserve it. Yeah, divine justice. Let's sit here and watch him die. He doesn't die. What do the people say then? Yeah, there you go. He's a god. He's a god. <laughs> Don't ever succumb to the fickle nature of the masses. Okay? <laughs> Just lock yourself in the Word of God. It was an amazing account. Uh, let me ask you something. Why do you think God, and I know I'm asking you to read the mind of the Lord, right? Why do you think God put that little account in there about the viper and about the snake? There's two or three different things right here that we could be looking at. Um, if he has a purpose for your life, nothing's going to interfere with that. Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. What else? Very good. What What did that open up there on the island? Yeah, Sharon, you're talking about that. The miraculous things always get people's attentions. What happened after that? He began to heal them. He began to heal them. He was taken to the, uh, was it the father of the guy that was uh, like the uh, chief of the island or something like that? Mm -hmm. Did you notice what that guy, what was wrong with him? He had a fever and something else. I don't remember uh, different translations said it different ways. Had a fever and 
Yeah, they need and dysentery. Again, and what type of physical state would he have been in? Emaciated, tired, it would have been a mess. Weak. Yeah, it would have been, I mean, this is someone you wouldn't even want to go near. And Paul did what? He goes, and what was the, what was the sequence seen on that? Uh, where, where is that in the scripture here? Let me find it real quick. Tell me what he does when he heals this guy. There was something good about that. I can't remember what it was. 28.8, and it says, after he had prayed, then he laid hands on him and healed him. There you go. He went into him, and then he prayed, and then he laid hands on him, and he healed him. Nene just Googled dysentery. Uh, don't do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yuck. Yuck, yeah. But you see what he did? He went into him. He went in, and he prayed. He laid hands on him, and he healed him. Well, the place just went crazy. And they brought all the people with diseases to him, and he healed them. Yeah, Luke was with him too. And, and all that's absolutely true. This this thing right here with the snake also does one other thing. I think it gives us, uh, you know, the best commentary on Scripture is what? Y'all you know, you know this is great precept, people. The scripture. scripture. Yeah, absolutely. I think this gives commentary on Scripture. What am I thinking about? <laughs> You're talking about the snake, right? Yeah, I'm talking about the snake. Talking about the Bible the ass. Are you talking about Satan? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm giving us a few moments here to think. Yeah, it does show the power of God, Sharon. Let me narrow your thoughts down a little bit. Think about the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> Cora's going, what's the question again? <laughs> Everybody's saying that. What's the question again? <laughs> Uh, he's bit by a snake. The last chapter of the book of Mark is often greatly debated. And that's the, 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 the verses that talk about that as we are going, that they uh, that they'll oh. handle, handle snakes or drink poisonous mm -hmm. things and you won't be harmed. 16, 18. What, what does it say? They will pick up serpents. Uh, well, it starts in 17. And these yeah. signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And see, what happened right there with Paul, I think that's exactly uh, what the Lord meant by that. Now, Karen says, isn't that the portion that sometimes is left out of some of the translations? Yeah, perhaps. Most of the time what you'll see at the end of Mark in the 16th chapter from verses, uh, I think it's verse 9 in it through verse 20. Uh, it'll have a bracket around it. It'll say something like, uh, and, and be real, you'll see these kind of things all the time. It'll say uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, manuscripts don't have this portion of the scripture. It'll say that not mentioning that the bulk of it does, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and no. so those... There is a section that comes right after it that says that it's uh, it's in italics and it's bracketed, but it's not that part. Well, I, most of the time it is. Actually, the one I'm looking at right now, it actually does have it bracketed off like that. Uh, really? Yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I've never had a Bible that had it uh, totally excised, you know, but uh, I know that there are some uh, that do that kind of thing. And it's just the kind of thing because, uh, yeah, Karen said Roger came to church with a snake handler. Yeah, we still have some of those in the deep south here. Uh, they're, they're fewer and they're further between. Uh, I don't think the NIV leaves it totally out. I think it's uh, uh, bracket. I think the New American Standard brackets it also. Uh, let me see a, a footnote. 
you'll, you'll have things saying that it's not in the original and this kind of stuff. Uh, just, just be aware of that because people will throw it up at you. And also they'll want to know, hey, what is this whole thing about? So can we go out and grab rattlesnakes and throw them around? No, because the Lord gives us wisdom. But I do believe that this encounter right here with Paul is an example of that. Okay? And I think there's been a lot of times in our life that we've probably eaten things and drank things that are not good for us and not even been poisonous. And the Lord's protected us and we've never known it. And so I think that's the uh, interpretation that's to be brought about right here. So he winds up uh, in Rome, as we said, and uh, receives a, a somewhat friendly greeting. Uh, has people that come in. Some of the Jews believe. Some of them don't believe. Really, at the end of Acts, you see uh, Paul actually saying to them, hey, you know, the Holy Spirit was right when he was describing you. Then go to these people and say to them, you know, bring the word. But hearing you'll hear and you'll not understand. Seeing you'll see, but you'll not perceive. And, you know, he quotes the scripture right there. <clears throat> so, uh, anyway, let me, let's, let's deal with these last things here in our final moments together. There were several of the books that they said to uh, uh, read if you had time, you know, Second Timothy, all these things that he wrote from Rome right there. Can you just tell me in, in a big general sense what Paul was addressing with these things? Uh, when he wrote to the church at Philippi, what was he talking about? Just in a big picture. I guess what I'm asking is, what is the book of Philippians about? Yeah, he talks uh, about living in, in Christian harmony. Yeah, uh, getting along with each other, rejoicing in the mm -hmm. Lord, how to have joy. Uh, if you wanted to uh, give a one-word definition of Philippians, joy. Uh, what was what's Colossians about, the letter that he wrote to the Church of Colossus? Yeah, uh, it's... Um, yeah, everything you're saying is absolutely right. False teaching, Gnosticism. Uh, yeah, I, I would go Jesus, who Christ is, uh, Christ. I mean, it is one of the uh, most concise teachings on who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Uh, <laughs> if you've ever done the precept study on Colossians, you know what I mean. Uh, is it the second chapter where you get in and you get lost in the sea of pronouns? Uh yeah, I mean, it's just wow. Uh, oh, Karen, you feel like you're in a Bible drill? Well, that's good for you. It's good for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's very good. Because <laughs> we sort of are in a manner of speaking. Uh, he wrote Second Timothy from here. Uh, probably not at the first time that he was there, but maybe at the first time. We don't know. Uh, what's Second Timothy about? Discipleship. Yeah, discipleship. Guard the treasure that's in you. He's telling him to do what? Press on. No, we'll press on. And he, and he deals with the problems that are going to be coming up and the things that are going to be happening. Yeah, that, yeah, Cora, very good. Entrusting what you've learned to faithful men. That, that's, a, that's a great thing there. Who said, was that Cora? Yeah, Cora that said that. Going back to what we were talking about a while ago. Uh, who are the faithful people that you are entrusting things to? Yeah, that's a good question, huh? You know, who is it we are imparting things to? It really shows us how we are to be, um, yeah, Gene, making disciples how we're to be living out, how we're to be uh, reproducing, how we're to be reproducing. So, yeah, who are you in part of these things too? Children, grandchildren? Covenant sons, things like that. Yeah, those at work. Mm, absolutely. So he sits there in uh, uh, Rome uh, for two years in his own rented house. And, and I love what it said at the end of Acts. Let me just read this and we'll be done with this part. And he received all who came to him, 
preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Oh, Karen, what study are you talking about on Wednesday nights? I just saw that. Second Timothy, precept upon precept. Oh, that's right. I forgot you're doing that, aren't you? Is that not a great study? It is absolutely wonderful, and we'll be following that up with Titus and then Amos. Titus and then what? Amos. Is there any particular reason for that order? Yes, but you'll have to come to find out. Oh, don't do that to me. Oh, really? That's going to drive me crazy thinking about what your reason is behind that. Uh, who's Andy, Sharon? How about Andy? I must have missed something. Oh, Amos. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay, okay. I got you. I'm thinking, Andy, the gospel of Andy, is she talking about Mayberry? You know, what What, what are we doing here? No, Second Timothy is phenomenal. It really is. But at the end of Acts right here, notice what he was doing. He's preaching the kingdom of God, and he's teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. How was Paul doing that? He's preaching the kingdom, teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus. What was his attitude? Yeah, that's Sharon, with all boldness, without hindrance. The New King James says, with all confidence, no one forbidding him. I thought he was in jail. I thought he was uh, being detained, maybe. He's in house arrest. He is. Mm -hmm. He is being detained. But did you see how the Lord was moving? Yes. Who, yeah. He's paying the rent. I, I guess he is. Well, the churches kept sending to him, uh, you know, from the yeah. different places that he had established churches. Right, right. But, you know, he could have easily sat there and been crying the old oh, woe is me's because he couldn't get out there in that boat and go where he wanted to go. So what's the lesson for us? Be content. Be content. Very good. Be what else? Be ready to be offered up. Yeah. Bloom where you're planted. Absolutely. Be ready in season, out of season, be offered up. Every one of those soldiers heard the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, Cora. The bottom line is this. Be faithful. Be faithful. You may sit there and say, Man, I, it's hard to be faithful because I've got two kids and i got a third one on the way. Anybody ever been there? <laughs> hey, Nate's going, hey, now. <laughs> no, you're faithful right where you are at that point in time. You talk to your kids. That's right. Yeah, that is interesting, isn't it, Sharon? Oh, yeah, well, Nero was the one that eventually got him, right? The executed Paul. But, yeah, the, the Jews had no answer for this because what he had said was true. He had been faithful and brought the message to him. And he says truly what the word says. You know, they departed. And the Jews had a great dispute among themselves. Not with Paul. They'd been disputing with Paul all along. But Paul had the truth on his side. Uh so the things that I think really struck me was uh, about the whole encounter with Paul and everything was the timing issues that we spoke about at the very beginning. But then also what somebody else had said at the very beginning, I can't remember how you worded it, but how, um, you know, probably combative and confrontational are the wrong words. But Paul, in bringing forth the truth of the gospel to people, he didn't back down even when they rose up. He just kept presenting the truth, presenting the truth, and presenting the truth. And, uh, folks, we live in the day to where uh, that's, 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 that's what's needed. 
Yeah, it really does, doesn't it, Cora? Yeah, y'all read what Cora's saying right here. Yeah. It really does give you some insight into really the flow of it and how uh, uh, how emotional it was. I mean, to the point of death over religious issues, you can get 40 people together and want to kill somebody. Yeah, that's good, Karen. That's good. And her grandkids are in, uh, oh, Karen, she sent that to me privately. I'm sorry. Uh, she does a Bible study, wanted to discover yourself things with her grandsons on Friday nights. And her grandkids are in Uganda. And so they, I guess uh, you use Skype or something like that. Yeah. We can only do chat because the uh, Internet's not strong enough. I'm going to post their uh, wall that they've been writing the names on and also uh, them reciting their verses. Ooh, okay. That's great. Well, good. Anybody else have anything you'd like to share from uh, whew, really this <laughs> really overwhelming lesson? I can't wait to next week. What, what are we going to do next week? Revelation, Hebrews, and John. Uh, the Lord wins. You know, what do you do with that? <clears throat> you know, it, that might be the best way to approach it, Sabrina, though I know you're uh, being humorous here with a light reading. It's just to take it and just listen to it and just read it and not get distracted by the, the details and just read it. And it's just uh, uh, an overview reading kind of thing. So. Yeah, it is interesting. I'm wondering if that's just because of the way that everything sort of comes together. I think I might know why. Well, Revelation by itself is just Revelation. John, as the gospel, reminds us of the whole gospel story, but it falls outside of the synoptic gospels and the way that it's approached. And then Hebrews, the same thing. You know, those are three very distinctive books uh, within the scripture, particularly the, the New Covenant. So, uh, so I'm thinking that might be the, the rationale behind it all. But, uh, you know, listen to him. Spend some time with him this week. Uh, absolutely, Carl. Yeah. It is Revelation, Lord. Yes, yeah, Sue. You want to say oh, No, I don't know why my mic keeps cutting off. Uh, well, sometimes I turn it off because of the ambient noise in the background. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sorry about that. Can, oh, it's not, no, no problem at all. Sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it gets more sensitive, so I can sort of do that. Oh, you want to plug part two of Daniel? We're going to do part two of Daniel. <laughs> uh, we're actually starting that uh, this next week. This next week. So if you want to join us for that, that's on Friday. I mean, on, on Monday night. Sorry, on Monday evenings. <clears throat> so anyway. Uh, Is this the same one we did? Mm, yeah, basically. Basically, they've reformatted it, and they may have done some editing. I can't even tell you uh, what they did uh, that's different with it. So, but basically the same one, yeah. Yeah, it picks up Chapter 7. Daniel Part 2 uh, does uh, Chapter 7 through 12 of what people refer to as the, the prophetic part, the part where Daniel had dreams and visions. <laughs> Gene's saying about cookies for. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Send out an email on that one. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm going to let you know some. I've actually uh, sent a couple here locally in some Facebook posts and things like that. But Oh, sure. Yeah, we're going to record all of them. And as a matter of fact, I've actually moved uh, all these classes, a bunch of other videos that I've done, the precept classes, over to uh, uh, my YouTube channel. So you can just go to my website and just go to the YouTube channel there, and you'll find a playlist that has, like, all of Daniel Part 1. Uh, has these classes, has everything there. Uh, it is 5.30 Central Time on Mondays. So just make the adjustment for yourself, uh, 5.30. Oh, I know. It's, it's sort of uh, – I had to do it then because uh, karate. <laughs> I know, but I, I, I do a TV program after it, so I'm locked into that. So uh, I know a native – uh, how long does part two uh, – oh, for the class, it gets to last an hour, hour and 15 minutes as far as the class length. The Daniel part two study, I think, is 10 weeks long, something like that. <laughs> Sabrina's trying to tempt me into things right here. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what else say? Mm. This you should do Daniel part two on Tuesday night. <laughs> In addition to the Monday night one? Well, it's the same material. All you have to do is talk about it again. And so how many of y'all, okay, let's do this. We'll, we'll do, I'm from a Baptist background, so, you know, we always vote on everything. You know, they they vote on whether to seek the Lord or something, you know. And uh, so y'all raise your little golden hand if you'd be interested in doing Daniel part two on Tuesday night at this time. What month? <laughs> I, it's, there's not a cookies four, five, and six, is there, Gene? <laughs> that I'm aware. So no, they'd uh, have to add books to the Bible if there were going to be more cookies. Yeah, I don't know why Aaron's over there flagging me with that, waving his hand. Karen, apparently, he doesn't know that every time he does it, it makes an obnoxious sound in my headphones and nobody else's. Maybe that's why he's doing it. I don't. That's the reason Lene is doing it now. Yeah, thanks. Why did I say that? Um, those of y'all who've taught these things know that you get obnoxious sounds in your headphones with this WebEx when people do that. So uh, I'll take you know, that under, uh, under advisement. You, also, people could call in on their iPhones and with unlimited calling and join the class. Oh yeah, yeah. While you're at karate and things like that. Oh, I'm yeah. driving. I'm driving at that time. Do you really want me to tell you what I've done with that before? Oh, I know it can be done. It's just that like you're flipping through pages. Especially yeah, I've, I, yeah that, well, that's the thing. Yeah, I've actually I've actually done classes driving down the road and done them from an airplane. <laughs> that kind yeah. Of stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're watching what your daughter's writing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I did. I actually taught a piano lesson one time from the car. Uh, driving across North Carolina on I-40, I had a student in Miami, and I thought, hey, I'm just going to try this, and I logged on my tablet, and she popped up, and she said, where are you? I said, I'm in the car. And she said, well, I hope you're not driving. I said, no, I'm driving. I said, start playing, and so we did like an hour piano lesson while I'm driving down I-40, and uh, I thought I could get used to this multitasking like this, you know, so, uh, but anyway, um, hey, let me pray for us. Thank you all so much for your faithfulness and your encouragement. Um, do uh, spend a little more time this week because there are vast amounts of reading, but I think it's, I mean, it's just so, so good. And, and most of us have read these things before, you know, but uh, um, I think in light of what we've learned here these last few months, we'll see even more. So, Father, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the, uh, the encouragement, the exhortation of the life that Paul lived here before us and the things that we've seen, particularly, Lord, the letters that you released to him while he was sitting there. Uh, he couldn't go anywhere, but, Lord, that he was faithful, that he preached the kingdom of God, and he taught the things concerning the Lord Jesus. Lord, may we do the same things. And, Father, particularly this week as we examine uh, John and Hebrews and Revelation, Father, I pray that you will bring things together for each and every one of us right here, that you will bring it together in our mind and in our spirit in the way that we've never seen things before. Lord, each one of us has spent a lot of time in your word through the years, and I pray, Lord, that this will be a week that we will actually feel you bringing things together and bringing understanding unlike anything we've had before. And so, Lord, I thank you and I praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you all again so much. And I'll see you again next time for the last one, okay? Dale, I gave you a plug for your piano lessons on somebody's Facebook page. Oh, did you? Okay, so don't be surprised if I hear something, huh? Well... Hopefully you'll hear something. <laughs>